All right, welcome back to the show, everyone. Uh, as we said before the break, uh, we're going to be continuing with this very interesting discussion mm -hmm. about security during the course of this election. So, Mr. Macri, I know you were going to talk about the day after, but I, but I, want, I, I want to take your mind a bit backwards before you talk about the day after. Okay. In the run-up to these elections, uh, we had seen other elections. We saw Oshun, we saw Ekiti, and we saw a few by elections you know, between 2015 and now. One thing that had always been the hallmark of all those elections was this overwhelming show of force, the display of you know, massive deployment of police, army, and other security personnel, which tended to cow even those who may have thought it was an opportunity. But now we're talking of virtually all across the country. It isn't going to be possible, for example, Ijama has some um, figures here. Yeah. Like for 24,000 mobile policemen, that's the figure we have for now, 4,000 counter-terrorism operatives, 8,000 personnel of the Special Protection Unit personnel deployed all across. Now, I don't know whether they want to increase this figure or whether that's what we have. I mean, we'll this, this is a small figure if you're talking of the country. If you're talking of one state, it's a lot. But if you're talking across the country, do you think that the idea of that massive deployment was good in that it stopped potential troublemakers in their tracks? Or is it going to now become a problem because the forces will be spread too thin? First of all, we have to look at what we want to achieve. What we want to achieve is free and credible elections. Peace. Yeah, peaceful, you know, elections. And then, of course, internationally it is not acceptable when you even see military men, not to talk of armed policemen, but military in fatigues. But you heard them say they'll be friendly. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you heard well, the chief of army staff say that. Yeah, he said that. And uh, in fact, yesterday I was listening to when he said that about 95% of the army was going to be deployed. I just don't see how that is going to work. You know, but anyway, um, what we want to do is to allow people to come out from their houses to go and vote. Now, when you have military men all in military fatigues and guns and everybody all over the place, and then, of course, a single shot will stop everybody from so going So you think it would be counterproductive out. then? It is counterproductive. I think we need to find a better method in trying to make sure that elections are free, fair, and credible, you know, and that will depend more on how the deployment is done. Now, for that, let me go to DIG Azuma. You said in your statement earlier that um, you, in 2015, you were on ground everywhere. You saw this thing unfold. So I want to ask now, between 2015 and now, you've seen what we've described as this massive deployment. Maybe that's what's going to happen this time around with the army joining in, with the police and other security agencies, the DSS and all that. Do you think that in itself deters potential troublemakers? Or does it, as our report earlier alluded to, might create some element of voter apathy with people saying, look, rather than get caught in any crossfire, let me I just sit at home. home. You see, um, deployment during elections, we have rings of deployment. Like uh, the military they are talking about are not going to be visible at polling points. They, they, they will be at the outer ring. Then we have the inner ring that contains the police and other security services. So uh, people should not be afraid of the number being mentioned that uh, will be deployed during uh, uh, elections uh, come uh, 20, I mean, uh, this 16th of uh, uh, this month. So uh, for the previous ones, you know, it was strategic. It was, uh, uh, it was done to, you know, put fear into those who would move from different states to go there where elections are taking place to cause problems. But this time around, you discover that the elections are spread all over the country. So instead of having criminals uh, you know, facing one particular state, uh, that, would not be, uh, that would not be, uh, because uh, they will be spread all over. And then the security agencies have been deployed all over to take care of those uh, who would they want to form trouble, or foment trouble, rather. OK, I get what you say, that people should not be afraid. But we have members of the audience here who are a bit afraid you know, from the questions that they, they want to ask you, and that goes for the entire panel. And let's have Moyo Sore at Dedeji. She's worried about protection of core members on duty during the election. So what's going to happen to them? Let's hear her ask her question, and then we'll, we'll take your response after other questions. 
Good evening. My name is Moyo Sorolo Adedeji, 400 level from mass, of mass communication at um, Caleb University. I'd like to ask that for um, past elections, we've been having situations where I am youth corp members are dying due to the fact that they are working as INEC officials during the election. And then this same election is going to happen again. What are the protection measures, what are the security measures put in place that will secure the youth corp members, that will, that will also satisfy others that are to come, that yes, we also want to partake in this first coming election. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll, we'll take that question. And then we also have someone who's concerned about how prepared the police are for this. I know we've read out some numbers, some figures of the security deployment, but he's concerned about whether the police are really prepared. And that's Isaac Otumala. Good evening, everybody. Like I told you earlier, I want to ask what how preparedness is the police force for this election in order to be not being partisan to any political party and to ensure that every member of the political party has the divide to allow to vote. Okay, fantastic. Now let's take the last one now. This one is a little bit comical. And he says, how do we deal with the perception that leaders have already been chosen? So there's no point even coming out to vote. The, the thing is already a fixed fight. And that's Victor Fadari. Good evening. My name is Fadari Victor, a final level student of industrial chemistry, Caleb University. And my question goes thus. There's this notion and perception that um, the winner of the election has been predecided by certain permanent authorities. Um, what then does democracy come into play in this decision? Thank you very much. That is assuming that that is correct. But let, let me go to you, um, Mr. Lecky, the INEC commissioner, mm -hmm. and ask you this. Um, in the run-up to this, a lot was made about the fact that during elections, security agents and agencies are supposed to respond to directives issued by INEC, because INEC is the umpire of the electoral process. But what we see often is that INEC is doing its thing, the security agents are responding only to directives issued by their own superior officers. Have you this time been able to synthesize that uh, process so that, for example, the question of the security of uh, youth corps members during the electoral process, the issue of uh, uh, how bipartisan, prepared how prepared are. the police are in terms of the synergy and all of that, has been resolved this time. So just tie the three questions in and respond, and then we'll have other members of the panel respond as well. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, we must look at security across the value chain of the election process. Security both for materials and persons, and security for the process. It's uh, security for the electorates who have uh, taken upon themselves to come out to vote. Now, I, I, I see a sign of movement and improvement looking at the over 195, 96 election we've had, 620, you know, 50 general election. For the first time, I'm noticing that um, in a number of the states, the police deployment architecture is, a bit, is more open. In other words, we're having advanced dispo, uh, you know, uh, deployment ahead of time. What this means is that usually one of the biggest markers of a good election is usually when you open the polls. I've had issues in which the polls are not opened on time because of fears of uh, the ad hoc staff not having enough security cover. But now we're seeing a situation where we know ahead of time which police officers or security is going to work in a particular place and also that it doesn't really you know, become a constraint in able to reach and know exactly where they are deployed. So that's a good sign. Now, we have had a lot of discussion with the police establishment and other security agencies, and there are also there is a, lot, a number of training as well. So we believe that we are heading into the 2019 general election with better prepared, what is going to be a more pleasant you know, security uh, architecture to guarantee safety for everyone, both the electorate, both our hard work staff, and our materials. Now, you know, security is a very serious matter. I have conducted election in places like uh, Rivana area, like Bayelsa, where, honest, you know, whether you like it or not, we must have some armed forces. When we go through the creeks to go and deliver material, we need a tugboat in front of the boat and a tugboat behind the boat. 
There's no way we cannot do that. And yet you don't want, you know, armed forces around the election. We have to do these things. So these things are not like one glow fits all. We have to look at it from one situation to the other and see how the security agencies respond to the need. I think everybody is committed to a free, fair, and safe, pleasant, and secure election. So all these elements need to be put into consideration. Okay, let me I believe that going into the 2019 elections, which is starting from uh, you know, next uh, week, Saturday, we'll have a better police uh, you know, experience and security experience going forward. That okay, is Mr. my Lecky, belief. But we have, we have a, 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 a former deputy DIG in the studio there, so he will be able to tell you more about how prepared he thinks the police are. You know, since you're from INEC, I, I, I take it that you want everywhere to be secure. But we have a representative from the police force. And what do you think? How do you see it? Well, uh, the DIG, well, I can please tell on. you what I the know based on our engagement with the security agencies. You know, so that's what I've just reported. And we have had a series of engagement through our consistent process, including as early, you know, late as uh, yesterday. And we're having this series of engagement ever since we have the new IG, even can before then. Can you tell us then. one thing so that has come out of the you, engagement? You know, can, you, can you tell us one tangible thing you're going to do differently following all the series of engagement that you have you been having? Well, let me tell you one tangible thing I believe we are going to do. What I've alluded to just a little while ago, in the sense that we have some forward deployment which is the first time we're having their coming to open. In which case, like places like Lagos and a number of other states, we'll have the deployment, we'll know the people who are coming ahead of them. They are deployed according to the racks, according to the polling units, so we know the officer that will work there, and so we have better assurance that there'll be protection for both, uh, secure, for both our ad hoc staff as well as our material. So we're securing the process from the beginning through the entire value chain to the end of the elections, including reverse uh, you know, logistics after the polls, we are ensuring that people are going to come. Know that after the polls, we don't have the security to escort our staff and materials back to our bases. So this is something very new that I think is good, you know, uh, coming out from the series of engagement we have had with the security agencies. Now, let, let's go to the DIG. DIG Azuma, you were, you were about to respond before Mr. Lecky, you know, put the rider that he put in. What's your, what do you see this time around in terms of the original question that we asked about the synergy and the deployment as far as the relationship between INEC and the security agencies are uh, this time as opposed to 2015. The synergy has always been there, and um, just like we have been doing operations, we, 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 we deploy men before, during, and after the elections. Uh, I, like uh, he may, did mention, we've been having trainings together with the INEC and other stakeholders. These trainings are ongoing, and they'll be ongoing until the commencement of the elections. Uh, for the copper who asked about the security of the coppers, in fact, the security is not only for the coppers, but for every person, every stakeholder in, this, in the whole process, beginning with voters, the uh, electoral materials, the electoral official, officers, and even uh, the coppers who are going to be engaged. Uh, we do that uh, maybe starting from this week or next, uh, uh, a few days from now, the policemen will be deployed to Coppers Lodge to have 24 hours guard for these coppers. And like uh, he has mentioned, the coppers are escorted to wherever they are going to uh, perform their electoral duties. And the policemen also uh, see that these materials that are used for elections are escorted to where they are supposed to be escorted to. So I don't think there's going to be any problem there throughout these elections. Besides, Mrs. Bayou, uh, uh, sorry, I want to, DIG, I want to put you on pause. Has taken DIG, I want to put you on pause. I want to put you on pause and go to Mrs. Bayou. Uh, both the DIG and uh, the INEC National Commissioner have expressed what I would call optimism. <laughs> now, you are outside of that box. What is it that you see in terms of this synergy between security agencies and INEC as displayed on the actual day of elections? And while you're answering that, I was also going to throw in, you are from Global Rights and that's where you work. What happens when there's an infraction you know, at that polling booth, in terms of if somebody has died or somebody's in the hospital, who is liable? Is it INEC? Is it the party? You know, who can you hold responsible on the field? Well, thank you for those questions. First of all, let me say before I, I answer your questions that it's heartbreaking that we as a country are thinking so much in terms of structural security, of security forces, and we're not a country at war. And we have this many security forces on our streets, at our polling booths, monitoring elections, 
and of course then hyping the security issues that we already have. Now we've systematically had an increase in the number of forces, of security forces, that have been deployed from election to election. We are not a country at war. Let's state and let's agree that this is not normal in any country. Mm. Then, with the exchange between INEC and the police, it's still very surreal that this is how much we think of ourselves as a people, that we will be a people that will continue to hold themselves to violence, to insecurity. We have a larger problem, and we need to get rid of the knee-jerk reaction that wastes a few months to elections, and we think that security forces will solve our insecurity issues. We need to think deeper, we need to act faster, we need to be more proactive about ensuring security throughout our country. This, this is not acceptable. That said, the number of security forces that were sent out to Ekiti State and to Oshu State already at the back of people's minds suggests that there will be intimidation, irrespective of what um, the National Security Advisor has said. We must then begin to recalibrate our body language and begin as a people to reclaim our country and say, this is not acceptable. How do we ensure relational security in our communities in a way that guarantees that we know that it's our elections and that we trust one another and that we will do this right? Okay, that was... are the type of conversations I'm looking forward to at this time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Macri, let me just ask you, because a lot of the time you hear security architecture, I mean, <laughs> being a former man in the service and all, when you hear intelligence reports, that's what the APC say, oh, they have reports that this is what the opposition want to do. And then the opposition say, oh, we have empirical evidence that this is what the other side want to do. When you have clashing empirical evidence, you know, how should the electorate receive it? It depends on the source of those Empirical evidence and intelligence, intelligence yeah, reports. Yeah, empirical evidence or intelligence reports. Well, this uh, is coming reports. from, from the, the spokespersons of both parties. I can tell you one thing right now. Well, I know that the parties could go ahead and uh, uh, hire their own people to gather intelligence for them. But uh, just like statistics, you can read statistics upside down, whereby you can read it to suit yourself or you read it to suit you know, somebody against somebody else. Uh, with my experience in Nigerian politics and elections, I, I, I think that, you see, most, the politicians are all the same. And they are the cause of the problems. Just like uh, the lady said but out they there. They said they all have different ideology. They're not there the is same. no ideology in Nigerian politics. There is none at all. You know, and you find out, that's why you see people crossing carpets up, up and down. <laughs>